Establishing connection to science night. Please stand by. Welcome back to another edition of the Science Night Podcast. My name is James, and with me as always is Steffi. Hi. And Jason. Hello. Tonight, we are going to talk about busting beetles, magpie mayhem, and plastic policy. Later, we're going to have Steffi's conversation with climate scientist, political hopeful, and just kind of an overall amazing and inspiring person, Dr. Deviani Singh. But first the news. We can't be a podcast that covers current events and pretend that the Russian invasion of Ukraine isn't happening. And I want to start this part by saying the most terrible outcomes that are going to happen from this are the loss of life, the loss of community, and just the suffering that comes with it by the people of Ukraine. And we also have to acknowledge the many Russian deaths that are occurring for absolutely no reason. But there are a lot of other outlets that are far better equipped to handle that reporting. And we are a science communication podcast. So we are going to talk about the Russian invasion in that context. And there are so many different stories and so many different angles talking about this. And some of them are a little less than true. Some of them are a little overhyped. So we're going to talk about that. So team, news team, what do we think? What do we got? Some scary stuff going on. I've been really impressed, though, with the tenacity and the speed with which several science-related endeavors have been quick to condemn what's going on and and offer their own sanctions, so to speak. So, you know, researchers at MIT who had helped establish one of the research universities over in Russia, and they've severed ties, at least formal ties, uh, with the institution over what's going on. To me, that is really just exactly what needs to happen. You know, we are in a place here where human life is being cost. And, you know, science is very important. Science actually is going to help the human race in many ways. But one of the best ways it can do it right now is to condemn what's going on and say, look, the progress that we are making needs to halt because there are bigger things going on right now and we need to show our solidarity with others. So, you know, there's a whole bunch of stories out there that's are enlightening and and really sort of restore my faith in humans. We also have a letter launched by Mikhail Gelfin, a, a, a Russian bioinformatics specialist at an institution protesting the war. The letter denounces the war and it says it will turn Russia um, into a country that can no longer have their scientists be able to conduct scientific research because they can't cooperate with colleagues from other countries. So my field of research, very international. We work with people all over the world. And when things like this happen, it really halts progress because we need everyone's input. And it makes it really challenging to collaborate with people. And there's uh, over 400 signatures, nearly 400 signatures from Russian scientists and science journalists protesting this. Yeah, it's it's interesting because you know, Mikhail Gelfand in particular was very vocal after the annexation of Crimea and saying, look, this is not okay. And this is going to make Ukrainian scientists, you know, really suffer here. And so what we're going to do is make an effort. What he did was make an effort to go there and involve Ukrainian scientists in his work, to give lots of public lectures, to make sure that the Ukrainian science community didn't feel isolated, even though they were, you know, the targets of Russian aggression. And um, it's really courageous of him to sort of pen this letter, knowing that like his life is on the line, potentially. When you speak truth to power, especially in a place like Russia, you know, you have to worry about you have to take care of number one. And, you know, that's yourself. But I think it's ratcheted up several notches when we're talking about doing it in the context of Russian um, government. And so, you know, I kudos to him, especially because he said to his students, look, this is what we're doing. But any of you who feel the need to protest, remember, nobody needs to be a hero. Take care of yourself. Don't put yourself in harm's way. Let me shoulder the burden here and the rest of the professional science community. To me, that was 
That was leadership. Mm -hmm. There's also, you know, a fair amount of stories that are coming out about potential ecological disasters that could come from this conflict. You know, we saw uh, on the news, huge fuel supply uh, depots just on fire, spewing, spewing all of that into the atmosphere. Uh, the invasion made its way past the Chernobyl uh, nuclear reactor facility, which seemed like on its face bad. Uh, and it's also led to a little bit of confusion coming out of that area about radiation spikes and the potential for something happening in there. And Steph, you read up on this a little bit more. Yeah. So, okay, let's just look at it from just high level overview. The IEA says that Ukrainian officials believe an increased radiation may levels near Chernobyl may have been caused by military activity or vehicles that are just stirring up the soil. I mean, that, that's about it. And there's, because of that, IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, Okay. Um, and because of that, at any time people hear the words Chernobyl and radiation, you get concerned, right? Because we all think about the Chernobyl accident that was a steam explosion in 1986. Because that that's our context. But really, there's, there's no damage at Chernobyl from the Russian takeover. There's also no active reactors at the Chernobyl site. There hasn't been active reactors since two, the year 2000. And nuclear power plants can explode like nuclear weapons. So that's just context there. And and just to realize the main reason Chernobyl was captured, it's located on the most direct route to Kiev from Belarus. So it's kind of a strategic move, right? I would just urge everyone <laughs> that uh, we should be more concerned about the damage from misinformation about the dan from the dangers posed by shuttered nuclear power plants than actually anything that's happening. If you want to find the most up to date information, I love. I'm going to suggest following Katie Muma on Twitter at Nuclear Katie. She, or, she is uh, a nuclear engineer and a doctoral candidate at the University of Wisconsin. Great science communicator as well. We'll also post post an, a, a link to this article that gives you more information. Use the SIFT method. This is a good good thing to do. Whenever you're looking at articles, use the SIFT, SIFT method for evaluating information. So first, stop before sharing. Investigate the source. Find better coverage if the source does not seem trustworthy. And finally, be sure to trace the information to its original context. That's a really excellent point, several points that you make, Steffi. You know, the misinformation campaign, right, if it's a campaign, or even just, you know, s sort of self-assembled, right, is dangerous. And so it's important for us to understand that things aren't as bleak as they may seem based on media over-sensationalism. Um, which is something that we have all experienced, you know, regardless of your political bent, right? You see it on all sides. Um, the media likes to hype. Um, that's sort of their role. That's what happens when you have a 24 hour news cycle. You know, they have to continue to generate headlines and I'm not an anti-media person by any stretch, but it's important for us to understand that we are getting our information from very few sources. And when those sources don't have the latest, greatest information, you know, misinformation can continue to spread. It's gotten even worse now where you have the wild west of social media, where there isn't a lot of regulation. But all of that is sort of background to the idea that while there may not be anything going on at Chernobyl per se, or anything that, you know, should cause concern, when you have one government take over the operations to, you know, contain all of the radiation from another government, in a hostile way, the potential for mismanagement of that facility is much higher than it was last week. And so while it may not be a problem now, it could still be a problem. And we have to figure out the best way to um, sort of figure out where the information that we're getting is coming from and how do we trust its reliability. Yeah. So all the radiation's contained. I mean, they, they did all of right. that from Chernobyl. The concern would be if you're bombing the site, right? That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. 
So like I said, there is a lot going on in Ukraine right now. There is a lot that will be going on for a long amount of time. And I should probably put a timestamp. We are recording this on Tuesday, the morning of Tuesday, the March 1st, just in case something drastically changes before the release of this. But, you know, don't don't get your news about this uh, from us. There are a lot of sources. There are a lot of great sources reporting from inside Ukraine right now. Uh, but just like Steffi said, be careful about what you consume and what you share. Let's talk about another story. Invasive species are nothing new in the era of changing climate. And this next story is an interesting way of addressing invasive beetles using social media. Gabe Verduzco, a ranger and apparently also a surfer, although, you know, reading this article, maybe the surfing comes first, has taken to Instagram and TikTok to show how much damage the short-hold boring beetle can do in California trees, and specifically how quickly they can do this. And he's using social media in a way to raise awareness and potentially find a new way of addressing this issue and it's something that maybe there is a use for in invasive species around the country around the world you know i live in vermont maybe this is the roll call what's your favorite uh, what's your what's your invasive species you're looking for in your areas co-host in vermont we're worried about the emerald ash mm-hmm. borer just tearing Here through too. our forest you're in indiana that's what we got in fact i have yeah. them out in my backyard or i had i had some in the ash that's no longer alive I have no idea, and I'm so happy I read this article and I can follow this researcher and find out more information because these beetles are so tiny that are taking over these trees and causing so much harm. And his TikTok videos are so great at showing you what to look for and and how to spot this. And you can see it out in nature and it brought awareness to me about something that I didn't even notice. It's pretty crazy to think that, uh, you know, when you have an invasive species like like the emerald ash borer, for example, right? It comes in, it takes over the ash uh, trees, and it destroys them, right? And it needs to find the next ash tree to be able to bore into and, you know, harvest its food sources and all that stuff, make habitats for its larvae. But, you know, it really does kill its host, the most successful parasites um, are the ones that don't kill, but take over and sort of possess their hosts. Um, we talked on the podcast several episodes back with Bill Sullivan, who talked about several different types of zombie type science related things. And one of the things he was talking about was uh, the fungus that drips onto ants on the um, rainforest floor and turns them into zombies. And so they basically like controls their brains, right? It's a parasite for them. It's controlling their moves, but it's not killing them. It's making them more successful. I mean, I understand that there are several parasites that will kill, right? A good example is rabies. You get rabies, you're going to die. In fact, my 11-year-old just the other day said, what is rabies? I said, something you want to stay far away from. Why is that? Because Mm. if you get it, you'll die. Always? 100% of the time, yes, you will die. There's not a cure for it. The cure, I guess, is really the prophylactic prevention, right? Don't get rabies. Stay away. So stay away from animals that are foaming at the mouth, for example. Rabies is then going to take over their behavior. It's going to cause them to do things to become more aggressive so that the rabies can get into the next host and the next host and the next host. So that's all well and good when we're talking about a host that is mobile. But when we're talking about a host that is sedentary, like a tree, it doesn't seem like it's the most successful reproductive strategy or parasitic strategy for them to you know, completely destroy their host. But they do. Yeah, they just move on to the next tree and they can burn through these trees and kill them in six months. And they have no natural predators. Right. What happens when the trees are gone? Right. I mean, that's right. That's the they end move game, on right? to the next tree. No, but what happens when all the trees are gone? Oh, yes. Yes. You know, we're I talking about saying. a sur- survival issue here for the species, not the individual. It doesn't yeah. seem the best strategy. It's interesting. Although that said, maybe they're tearing through invasively in parts of the country because they can right and in places where they're not invasive uh, maybe the damage is less um, so that the both species can sort of survive together sure 
you know, the, thinking they'll eventually get to a part where there is a predator to keep them in check. Maybe we have to do the old lady that swallowed a fly method of pest mitigation and and release a host of Australian magpies, which brings us to our next story. So here at the Science Night Podcast, we love talking about cool and unusual things having to do with animals, and this week is no different. A group of researchers from the University of the Sunshine Coast trying to learn more about the movements of Australian magpies were thwarted by the birds themselves, but they ended up learning a lot more about avian altruism. So I thought this was a great story about the unintended consequences of scientific research. I was going to say the same thing. When you get unexpected results, that's that's when science starts getting really interesting. Mm-hmm, <laughs> and you can sure. find yeah. new things. Yeah. It's true. You're absolutely correct. You know, you get weird, unexpected results and it makes it more exciting. Um, as mm-hmm. a field biologist, though, it also could be very frustrating, right? I mean, in this case, um, you know, money was spent on technology to try to track right? these magpies and they removed... The tracking devices. And it's not even clear how that happened, whether it was one individual who removed it from all the individuals or whether they worked collectively. But all I was thinking the whole time was magpies are a member of the corvid family of birds. And the corvid that I'm most familiar with is the raven. See, We see them a lot. I lived in Baltimore for a long time. And so um, ravens are everywhere, including M&T Bank Stadium. But uh, that said, ravens are giant. They're giant passerine birds. Passerine birds are perching birds, and so they have some cool anatomical adaptations. Magpies are are also part of that. So I'm thinking if you had ravens that are corvids and magpies that are corvids, and corvids are generally thought to be relatively intelligent family of birds, and clearly the magpie evidence here of removing tracking devices sort of backs that up, that idea up. If you get smart birds that can take that can you know take care of each other like that, like. We really got to watch our backs. That's yeah. all I'm thinking is that we got to really got to take <laughs> care of ourselves here because it's potentially really dangerous. We also know that corvids famously can hold a grudge too for many, many years. Uh, it's true. So. Well, it's not the only <laughs> thing that they can hold for many, many years. As it turns out, they have these really cool anatomical adaptations and their flexor tendons in their feet. So the tendons that help them, you know, flex their their toes perch onto a uh, onto a branch and so when they land they actually have this locking mechanism what? based on those tendons that allows their feet to lock onto the perch and that way when they are sleeping they're not going to fall off the perch and so you know maybe that's where holding grudges comes from <laughs> for long that's periods amazing. of time like yeah. they can't help it so passerine birds are cool and when you add this element on top of it these magpies taking tracking devices off like i'm a little scared Let's let's talk about the tracking devices. So when I first started reading this article, I thought it was like, you know, the little tags around their collars or something like that. I'm like, sure, they can they can pick that off. Okay, cool. These trackers were a new form of trackers that they were testing out and they're small backpack like harnesses that are lightweight um, that ha- hold the tracker and you can only release it with a magnet. Wow. Yep. <laughs> or as it turns out, a magpie net. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right? Whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. They're crazy. I mean, these things only weigh one gram, so they're small. Yeah. Um, they don't, you know, add considerable weight at all, but right. somebody had to be doing this. Like, you couldn't remove it from yourselves. Nope. You needed help. You're, you're <laughs> a dog owner, Steffi, right? Yeah. I'm going to assume for a moment that your dogs are microchipped. Yep. Okay. And that microchip usually happens in the scruff of the neck. Mm-hmm. And that's in part because animals can't reach that, right? It would be mm-hmm. akin to you getting microchipped, which maybe you have been microchipped. I don't know. <laughs> I don't uh, know. No, I know. Between your shoulder blades. I guess maybe you probably wouldn't know that either, right? <laughs> yeah. Putting it between your shoulder blades and your back, right? That's where these tracking devices were essentially located on these birds. And so there's no way that they could get to it. But someone else was helping them out. And there isn't a whole lot of evidence for, you know, sort of cooperation like this in magpies. And so that was sort of the unexpected result. But also the unexpected result that they won't be able to collect all of the data they wanted to collect. They wanted to know sort of right. how far they fly, right? Where do they go? You know, what are their home ranges like? And uh, who are they with? And granted, there were only five birds that were wearing tracking devices. So it's not like we're talking about 
150, 200 birds that, that all lost their tracking devices. There are only five. It's kind of like, you know, the Starlink um, <laughs> story last week, right? Eh, just a small amount of money, right? Right. Um, but still, it's crazy to think that that's going to set them back quite a bit in their research questions. Now, granted, they got some really cool results that they can talk about that are different from what they were expecting. Yep. But still, the science needs to march on. And, and there are reasons why they're tracking. They want to track these birds. And now they're back at you know, square one. There's also new unanswered questions like... Why are these birds removing these trackers? Did they think it was some type of parasite or what? Right. Good point. It's a good point. But that's like the most interesting thing. This group that was going to talk about to try to learn something that was important about like migration patterns and moving patterns turned out to like get some information on one of the great unknowns that is still out about evolution. And, and that is altruism. Mm-hmm. Right. No. It's <laughs> so good point. it's like. Yeah, they've they've uh, they've stumbled into this much bigger piece of this uh, this much bigger puzzle that's kind of stymied great minds all the way back to Darwin. I guess if it works out, so uh, love it when a plan comes together. In just a few minutes, we will play Steffi's conversation with Dr. Deviani Singh, and I think this next story is a good transition to that. Plastic in our ocean is spoilers a problem. In a new story from the American Association for the Advancement of Science is discussing a potential UN policy to address the reduction and monitoring of the situation. Now, the entire story is still ongoing and nothing is really settled or adopted or, or at the final stages. But I think the interesting part about this article is the idea of having a science advisory board involved in crafting this international policy. I think that's a good thing. And I think Dr. Deviani Singh would agree. But what does everyone else think about scientists getting involved in science policy? Do it. Who who better to do it than scientists, right? I mean, one of the great tragedies of sort of the modern world is that we've become so specialized in what we do that we often think we're the only ones who can understand it. And scientists are at the top of that heap, right? We use language that no one understands, not even outside of our own fields, to communicate with one another because it's efficient, right? I mean, when Steffi uses jargon to talk about fusion with other fusion scientists, it saves a lot of time and and effort in trying to get to the point of that conversation. But when Steffi talks about fusion with someone who's not a fusion scientist, like you and me, James, like she can't yeah. she can't use that jargon because we, our eyes will glaze over, right? I mean, we have no idea what she's talking about. And so um, Steffi does a really good job. Steffi is one of the few scientists who do a really good job when you think of all, the number of scientists that are out there versus the ones who are effective at communicating with a non-specialist audience. And so absolutely, scientists yes. should be involved in science policy. I understand that some people don't want to be involved in science policy because they think it detracts from their science. I would argue that the opposite is true. Um, You can shed light on your science by bringing that science to policymakers in an accessible way. And frankly, if you have any federal funding for science, your your obligation is to be telling the taxpayers who funded that work what you're doing. And that includes the politicians who may or may not have voted for that science. I 100% agree. Like, I went into science and I'm like, I do not like politics. I don't like writing. I don't like talking to people. (laughs) So I'm just going to hyper focus on my science and that'll help save the world. But like Jason said, I, if you, if you're not talking to people, no one knows what you're, what you're doing or what you're doing can possibly help others. We need to be involved in politics. We need to communicate what's going on to make change. And I'm going to take it back to this plastics. Wow. Each year, 11 million tons of plastic go in the ocean. This is a cargo ship worth every day of plastic we're just dumping into the ocean. That's not sustainable. That's bad. Yeah. I think this is kind of picking away at the old approach of like, you know, who better to have involved in this monitoring process than the plastic manufacturing industry? Of course, you know, we would want them involved in crafting this policy. And 
obviously that's not the way to do it. So having a science advisory panel that is involved with the monitoring, with the removal, with the implementation of regulations to just stop it before it happens, uh, much better than like, I don't know, Halliburton? (laughs) Yeah, I think you could pretty much say that's true for anything involving Halliburton. Sure. Right? To me, having the plastics industry involved in this is probably crucial if you want to get buy-in, but to have them leading something like this would be akin to having a UN panel uh, on discussing the invasion of Ukraine led by Russia, right? It's just toothless. It doesn't matter. It is just for show, and it's not going to be effective. What we need is buy-in from multiple levels with scientists at the top here, ones that are able to communicate with public and policymakers effectively if we're going to try to make any dent in this whatsoever. All politics are local, 100%, but sometimes you have to look through a different part of the prism, right, and see that the local politics also include a bigger geographic area than you thought. And so, you know, as citizens of the world, we need to be working together. We need scientists from all over the world helping to solve this problem. Um, We need governments from all over the world helping to solve this problem. We need plastics manufacturers from all over the world helping to solve this problem. But it starts by going and talking to your local elected officials and saying, we need to do something about this. Um, That's why, again, I'm going to go back to it. I'm going to say every single scientist needs to be out there advocating for their work or for science funding in general to their local politicians, to their um, state level politicians, to their country level politicians. Um, That's why in uh, nine days, I'll be virtually on Capitol Hill talking to my two senators about the importance of increased NIH funding, NSF funding as well. But the real focus is on the NIH this time for obvious reasons. I mean, we're still in the middle of a pandemic, even though you wouldn't know that from looking around in Indiana. You know, it's important for us to, to really get out there and say, look, this is what we're doing. This is why we need more money going toward this. Um, If we want to sustain our species, this is what we'll need to do. And scientists need to get over themselves and sort of get on the train here because ultimately, if you're not advocating for more science funding to your local politicians or not advocating for governmental interaction here to solve big problems, you're not going to have the ability to do your science indefinitely, right? You're going to end up with a situation where science isn't going to matter because, you know, not to be a fatalist here, but the survival of our species is sort of in the balance. And if we don't have our species surviving, there's no science to be done by us. Well, and it's not just scientists that can talk to their representatives too about supporting and funding scientific research. So I'm also going to DC um, to talk about fusion energy. So I can talk about Fusion Day, which happens every year. It's an advocacy day on the Hill, and it's open to not only active researchers, but people who are from nonprofit organizations, um, just people if you're interested in supporting fusion energy. It's an established one day a year where everyone comes together to talk to their representatives across the country about fusion energy and the benefits of plasma science. And so I know from my field, we do it. I'm sure there's other fields too. Um, So if you're an if you're a scientist, probably you can reach out to your professional society. If you're a citizen who's interested in fusion, you can join me. So (laughs) put that plug there. (laughs) Um, Yeah. USFusionEnergy.org. Check it out. Oh my gosh, I didn't even have to plug the website. Thank you. That's right. Just permalink it. You make a really good point, Steffi. Um, And that is that, you know, I was speaking directly to scientists for a moment there. Because I know that we have a bunch of scientists who listen to this uh, podcast. but, But it's just as important for someone who's not a scientist to be advocating on behalf of solutions that we need to, you know, solve problems that are global and plastic pollution is certainly one of them. I think this one's great too, because it's, it's, I, it wants to identify 
and understand the scope of the problem. Answer questions like how much plastic is too much? And it's looking at establishing metrics. It's trying to reduce pollution by targeting plastic's entire life cycle from birth as a raw material to death or, you know, trash. Some people talk about how we're going to recycle plastics, but we're not even recycling 10, less than 10% of plastics are being recycled. So this is a huge issue. You know, there was a story in our local newspaper not too long ago about what kinds of plastics are accepted at Indiana Recycling Centers and what kinds of plastics are actually recycled. It turns out that the vast majority of the plastics that they will accept at the recycling centers here are just then chucked and they're not recycled. And it might be as simple as we'll take this type of plastic, but the shape that that plastic is in is not going to be something that we can sell. And so forget it. We're just going to chuck it. And that's demoralizing. You know, how many of us recycle plastics every week thinking we're doing the right thing and it turns out we're not, right? Well, we are maybe doing the right thing, but the right thing isn't getting done. We're not there. And so that to me, that's just horrifying. How about we pivot to a conversation with a scientist that is going to actively seek change in policy? And that is our conversation with Dr. Deviani Singh, which will happen just after this message from one of our sponsors. <laughs> Hey, James, I got a package in the mail the other day from you. What did you send me? Oh, my gosh. I sent you the latest, greatest thing in Science Night technology. It is merch. Wow. That's right. Ladies and gentlemen, you can show your support to this very podcast by buying our merch. Jason, what can they find on our website? Oh, you can find all sorts of stuff. I have a nice big hoodie right here that I'm wearing. It says SciComm across the chest. I love it. It's got our Science Night logo on the sleeve. You can buy a laptop sleeve. I know you did that. You can buy stickers. I did. You can buy uh, magnets. Or you can buy Steffi's favorite things, the leggings and the crop hoodie that she uh, that she told me we needed to plug specifically because she adores them. Um, you can get anything you want, essentially. Please limit what you want to what you can find on our website. And that <laughs> website is scinite.com slash merch. Check it out today. Buy some stuff and let us know what you want to see on there. We got right. we have the opportunity to put whatever you want. So check it out again. Scinite.com slash merch. Welcome back to Science Night. Tonight we have with us... Dr. Deviani Singh, a scientist working on energy and climate policy, currently a postdoctoral economist fellow at the Environmental Defense Fund. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks, Debbie. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. And I was wondering, could you just tell us a little bit about what you do? And then we kind of want to hear about how you got into what you work on right now. Yeah, so I'm actually very interdisciplinary, which is kind of why I say I work on energy and climate policy as compared to when people are more specific, like I do this and that of X, Y, Z. Actually, during my master's, I was working on like prescribed fire and understanding all of that in the U.S. and kind of worked with the Nas National Park Service and the Forest Service. For my PhD, I was in the faculty of forestry, but I'm not a forester. I like to tell everyone that. I just happened to sit in that faculty. And I was looking at more like energy transitions and energy access. So things like getting clean cooking access in the global south or in India. So I did a lot of that work. I did some work with the First Nations in BC, in the Great Bear Rainforest on like sustainable forestry initiatives. My previous postdoc was looking at oil and gas emissions and like looking at just transitions away from oil and gas and the methane emissions from there. And then now with my most recent role, I'm looking at you know, natural climate solutions and the role they will play in the next decade or two decades in climate mitigation. So can you talk a little bit more about natural climate solutions? Yeah, and it's interesting because, you know, there's a lot of like environmentalists out there who are very anti this whole natural climate solutions or NCS uh, because they're like, oh, it's greenwashing. It's, you know, there's a lot of skepticism in this field. And, you know, it's often justified. Because the way the systems are right now, they aren't very good. There's a lot of uh, misunderstanding and the 
a lot of confusion. So that's actually kind of what I'm doing. We're trying to kind of get rid of some of this confusion and solve and give these positive examples on how to make NCS effective and more equitable in practice. Personally, the way I look at it, and this is my opinion, not where I work's opinion, I like to look at like, you know, we need to reduce our emissions. We need to reduce and move away from oil and gas. We need to mitigate that. But we can never actually truly be at zero emissions. And that's where I get a bit irritated with environmentalists who say, no, we don't care about net zero. We care about zero emissions is we'll always have emissions. Agriculture will have emissions. Other things will have emissions, right? Even if we get rid of fully oil and gas, we'll still need to mine for renewables uh, and their, you know, um, equipment and materials for renewables. So I I think we can reduce almost 90% of our emissions, but there might be like that five to 10% that's almost impossible to reduce. And that is where we need to be able to use these natural climate solutions. The reason I say current net zero plans are all bullshit, <laughs> sorry, my, sorry for the language, okay. is because you even look at ca- Canada, you know, they're like, oh, we'll go net zero, but there's a plan to increase oil and gas production. No, no, no. So for when I say net zero, I mean reduce all the emissions we can and then try to pull out our so-called offset. I hate the word offset, but offset the ones we can't. And um, I think I read it somewhere, which is very interesting. This is why people don't believe in NCS is if you look at all the current net zero pledges for countries or companies, we don't have enough land on the planet to grow that many trees, right? So that is why people think it's wrong. So they shouldn't be taken as an excuse to expand fossil fuel production and to continue what we are doing, but they should be, we need to be forced to, there's something called the science-based targets initiative, which kind of says, reduce your emissions as much as you can and then offset the ones you can't. So that's kind of what the natural climate solutions are. So there are things like avoided deforestation, reforestation, better management of agricultural land, agroforestry, wetlands, peatlands, and something that's not currently looked at, but could be interesting. And as uh, people are looking into it and scientists are looking into it is blue carbon. So like open ocean. Oh, wow. Okay. That's great. I love that you have this interdisciplinary background. And so I have to ask, I work in fusion energy, one of those alternative energy approaches. How does that fit into when you're talking about energy policy looking forward in our portfolios? So I don't know a lot about fusion, but I know like I always get confused between the fusion and the fusion and one of them supposed to be better than the other in terms of environmental impact. So that's something you could help me with. But I think they all have a role to play. Like, you know, they are cleaner sources. We need to look into it because one of my major concerns is as we do this energy transition, I don't want it to go from being big oil to big green, like to green capitalism, right? right? We need to make sure there's that justice and equity centered in it. And, you know, as we put in like dams or solar and wind, it doesn't become another way of land grab and shoving projects to indigenous ter- territory without their consent. But at the same time, at this point, we need all sources of energy that we can. And from what I understand about uh, fusion and all, like it's a very powerful source of energy, but little to no emissions. Uh, I say little to no because, you know, we still have to mine for some of these things. Right. So that, uh, some of that supply, like life, uh, like supply chain or what do you want to call them? Uh, those emissions. But I think we need to be looking into every possible uh, option we have at this point. We're running out of time. You know, people say we have until 2050 to reach net zero. Right. Um, it's, but remember, climate change is caused by the amount of carbon dioxide we put in the atmosphere and it stays there. So really, it's the next 10 years, according to me, that's critical. Because if we keep pumping a shit done in the next 10 years, it's still going to continue warming way past, right? So I think we need to really ramp up our climate ambition and not leave it for the later decades. So you bring up this time ur- in sense of urgency, and I love it. I'm with you there on that. What do we need to start doing now to make the biggest impact? If, if someone were to come up to you and say, what policy do we need to write and enact it now to start jumping on this 2050 goal, what would you do? Personally, I would say the one thing I can really make a difference is a Just Transition Act. And there might be other environmentalists who are like, oh, we need a just a normal energy transition. But I say Just Transition because, like I said, we don't want to leave those workers behind. Especially when you look at Canada, uh, you know, we have a lot of oil and gas workers and we, including coal workers in BC, and we want to transition them. You know, we have, we've seen the collapse of the textile industry in the US. We saw the collapse of the forestry industry in the US and Canada. 
we didn't know these collapses were coming or the end was coming, right? Um, so we couldn't protect the workers. We do know that the end of oil and gas is coming. It might be in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, but we know it's coming. So the sooner we can start retraining people, helping them move to uh, newer jobs and the next generation, instead of like offering oil and gas mining courses in universities, start giving options for green energy, uh, you know, courses in universities and colleges. For me personally, I think just transition would be the one policy that could make a huge impact because it has everything under it, right? It looks at the workers, right. it looks at equity and justice, and it looks at transitioning from oil and gas and coal to a greener, more renewable economy. I love that idea of a more holistic approach, and I think that's great. So a lot of people talk about climate change to save our planet, right? There's also economical impacts to it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and I think the economics, um, a lot of environmentalists get told that, oh, you don't understand the economics of it. So like I tell people, I'm like, I'm an economist and I'm a climate scientist, right? So I'm yeah. like, I understand both. And I also have an MBA in finance and worked in corporate America selling my soul for a while, but that's a whole different story. So, well, the economics, if you look at it, are actually clear. So I don't know how bad the impacts in the US were, but in British Columbia in 2021, we had almost every crazy extreme weather event. You know, we had a heat dome uh, where we had over like 600 people die. Um, wow. And we hit 50 centigrade degree temperatures unheard of in BC. Uh, then we ended up, you know, with because of that, the wildfires and literally towns burnt to the ground, like the town of Lytton burnt to the ground. And then we ended up with something called the cyclone bomb. We ended up with a tornado, a water tornado at UBC. Uh, should not be happening here. And then we ended that up. That sounds the- scary. No, but it's not <laughs> wow. ended there. Then we ended up with the atmospheric rivers after rivers that flooded BC and uh, effectively cut off Vancouver by land from the rest of Canada for a long time. And we're still rebuilding our highways from that. Um, wow. And so it was like this uh, meme I saw it in December. It was, they said, the BC ad- advent calendar. And it's like June was heat dome, July was <laughs> oh, no. fires, and then December. Oh, and then we had ex- the coldest uh, winter in 50 years in Vancouver with uh, minus 17 uh, centigrade temperatures here when it never gets that cold. So we had every extreme. Weather event. That's unreal. In one year, just one year, you just mentioned. More like six months. It was between June wow. and December. Wow. Right. And so my thing is, it's cost us billions, right? To rebuild highways, towns have to be rebuilt, all of these things. And so you're telling me that this, co- like, so when people say, oh, it's too expensive to work on the transition, my thing is, the cost of climate inaction is significantly way more than the cost of climate action. And if we see anything that happened in a six month period, and this isn't the new normal, I hate when people say new normal because it means this is a baseline and this is what it's going to stay at. Like I say, this is as good as it gets as the temperatures get warmer. This is not the new normal. This is the new minimum. That's not good. That's not good at all. Wow. Exactly. So when we're looking at the economics, let's talk about economics. Let's talk jobs. There are, there's enough research there that says more jobs will be created in the green energy transition than there are in oil and gas. People think that oil and gas people are losing jobs right now because of environmentalists. No, they're losing jobs because of technology. Now we have self-driving trucks. That's why they're losing jobs, not because of the transition. You want to talk economics? More, it, but there's more jobs, there'll be more economics. You'll have fewer disasters, fewer, less money on uh, dealing with rebuilding towns and you know, rebuilding highways. So it's actually cheaper. When you look at the economics of climate change, it is beneficial and profitable for us to act sooner than later. That's, I mean, it's clear to me. We need to get this message out more often. That's wow. why we're talking about it. Yeah, I love it. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so I want to go back to how you got to where you are today, because you mentioned you used to work in corporate America, right? So what made you do that transition? So it was an interesting story. So I grew up in the Indian Himalayas. And uh, my dad was a military officer, so we actually like traveled all the time and moved cities. But my family home in the Himalayas is kind of my only stability. I spent summers and all the vacations there. And I see these beautiful like neon colored birds that would come to the chestnut chestnut tree in front of the house. And um, it wasn't even like I wasn't that old. I was probably like when I was 10, 12 years old, I started noticing that those birds disappeared. And this was like late 80s, early 90s. And, you know, we were starting to hear about global warming and the impacts it was causing. And especially the Himalayas are feeling one of the major impacts, uh, right? I mean, it's also the global south, but also 
the Himalayas in general are losing a lot of their glacial cover. And so these animals were migrating to higher altitudes because it was getting warmer and they were basically just going extinct. And I was feeling sad because I have had such a deep connection to nature and animals uh, growing up in this forested Himalayan region. And so I wanted to do something, but, you know, I'm talking 90s in India as a woman. Really, my options were doctor, engineer or business. Oh, I yeah. definitely knew I didn't want to be a doctor engineer. I'm the different kind of doctor now, but <laughs> medical doctor. <laughs> um, so I decided I do finance. I do business. I do finance, make uh, tons of money. And then I would open up an ENGO or animal shelter homes. So that's like what my child brain thought would to do. And yeah. so I did business and, you know, I was in the rat race and ended up coming to the U.S. to do an MBA in finance which is what took me to Iowa City, as we were talking about earlier. <laughs> there you go, Midwest. <laughs> yeah, so I did my uh, MBA in finance at the University of Iowa and, you know, got into corporate America where I was selling my soul. And I was wow. really uh, unhappy. Uh, I was depressed because I was really working and helping corporations make more money at the cost of people and planet. And um, mm-hmm. I couldn't deal with it. And I was driving to work one day and I told my sister, like, she's like, you're living the dream. You know, you have a house, you have a boat, you have, a, you have two cars, this and that. And I'm like, then I'm the most unhappy I've ever been. And she's like, well, to be honest, um, it's because that's not who you are. You've never cared about all of this. You've only cared about nature and environment. And you're not doing anything to work towards that right now. And, you know, that really hit it home. Like somewhere along that rat race and trying to be, you know, where society tells you you have to have money and you need this and you need that. Right. Um, I lost focus about, and that's why I was unhappy because it was going against my morals and ethics. And so I walked in and I literally resigned. <laughs> and That's amazing and so inspiring. I think oftentimes people get afraid of change to do something different, to jump into it. And the fact that you just like went all in. But I need to acknowledge that I was in a position of privilege here because I did not have any debt from my uh, MBA school. Like a lot of people end up in thousands of dollars of debt from school. I also didn't have a family to support. Like if I had, you know, if I had debt, if I had a family to support and if my family uh, in India didn't support me and say, you know, we're with you, this is what you care about. I couldn't have made this uh, jump. It's not like I was rich, but I had the privilege that I did not have any other demands or dependence on me. Right. And so I can I can see why people stay in it. And I want to like make that, you know, like I don't want to be like, oh, you everybody can do it. I can understand why some people want to, but they can't. Right. And um, yeah, but it didn't stop that. I didn't know what to do next. <laughs> I quit and I was like stuck on a, I was on a visa in the U.S. And if oh, I didn't yeah. figure out what to do next, I would have to go home. And so, you know, took a road trip to find my soul. Anyhow, uh, long story short, ended up doing a second master's at the Ohio State University, back to the Midwest, no matter how hard I tried to leave it. Um, <laughs> back to the Midwest, to Ohio State, doing a second master's in environmental science. And I was like, this is what I love to do. And this wasn't an option when I was younger, right? Like me being a scientist, a woman of color, an immigrant, you know, being a scientist, what's right. that about? And then I was like, this is what I want to do. And so that's what brought me to Canada and Vancouver was for my PhD. And then I was like, this is it. This is me. And here I am. <laughs> That's amazing. I love you. You can just hear your energy and I I can see you. So I can see how happy you are with what you're doing. So this is just an amazing transition you were able to do and you're helping change things and affecting policy. And that's great. So I originally went into my field for clean energy research and I'm like, okay, the way I can make an impact on the environment is I just focus all in on the science And all I did was science, math, engineering. And so, yes, I do research, but then you have to communicate that to the public. It has to translate to policy and politics, too. So I know you've done a little bit in politics. So that is amazing, by the way. I think we need more scientists in in politics. Can you talk about your journey to that and kind of what led you there and what you are inspired to do through this path. Yeah. And thanks, Abby. You were, sir, I write about saying that, you know, in academia and research, we end up like being siloed and really working on it and think that if we do the science, it's going to, you know, do what it needs to. But I mean, let's be honest, the number of scientific papers we read, half of them, even though I don't understand, you expect a non-scientist and a policymaker to read through thousands of thousands scientific papers and figure out uh, what are like the top three things they should do for policy? No. So 
that's one of the reasons actually my whole like career I never wanted to stay in like the academic tenure track position is because it separated me from policy and I was doing policy relevant research and you know that directly would inform policy decisions and so we did you know write policy briefs op-eds but it was getting nowhere right it, it was um the politicians weren't listening I was emailing them they don't care um, right. And it's, I'm not talking of any party or the current government. I'm saying it's at every level of governance across the globe, right? Because they're listening to their, the people, the lobbyists, the people who pay for their campaigns. And um, so I had emailed, again, like when I was doing my PhD, all the, not all, I never emailed the conservatives in Canada. Uh, we have many other parties. We have uh, liberals, the New Democrats and the Greens. Uh, the Greens are actually a party in Canada and we have elected officials at all levels of government. So That's it's awesome. a good thing. Um, and I emailed, but I'm not partisan. Um, I just have to, uh, I'll get to that later. But so I emailed all, all three of them, all the three center and left parties. And only the Greens replied. And mm-hmm. they said, uh, you know, thank you for contacting us. We would love to uh, have your opinion and your expertise on this next, next letter we're writing about net emissions to the environment minister. Would you want to have a look over and provide us your scientific expertise? And I was like, Wow, these are the only pe- this is the only party that cared and cares about scientific expertise in writing their policies. And so a few months later, I um, had an email from one of the green organizers saying, hey, have you ever thought about running for political office? You know, it seems like you'd make a great person. Like, you know, you're doing a lot of outreach that. I said, I'll think about it. And then it's what's called a snap election, like an election in, when it's not a two party system it, and it's a minority government, you, it, a snap election can get called. Okay. And so I get a call from the green organizer saying, um, you have 24 hours to decide if you want to run. <laughs> and I'm wow. Like, uh, that was quick. <laughs> yeah. I was like, well, okay. And, you know, I was really frustrated and angry. I was frustrated and angry that politicians aren't listening to science. And here was a party willing to give me the platform, a scientific platform to raise these issues. And I was like, you know what? I'll take the science to politics. And I said, yes, I had no I idea I'm getting into I didn't know the first thing about campaigning or running for office. And my whole campaign team was my partner and me and a good friend of mine. And I'm like, so they're like, what do we do as campaign managers? I'm like, hell if I know. But we're PhDs. Let's research how to do campaign. (laughs) So we ran a a blitzkrieg of a campaign. It was a, a snap election runs only four weeks. Um, wow, that's we had only four weeks, but I yeah. ended up getting the highest percentage of any green candidate in my writing. Uh, the last one got six percent. I got eighteen against a cabinet minister that everybody liked. Wow. Yeah, and um, you know, I realized that people wanted a change, and that's what got me into it. I ran provincially then. I ran federally last year, and now I'm planning to run for city council, but. It was that first run that people literally came up to me on the streets and said, thank you for running. You've given us hope in politics again. I had professors at UBC email me and say, I voted for you because I know you'll do the right thing. And we need more the voice of science. I had South Asian women message me say, thank you for running. For the first time, I feel represented in politics. I had students emailing saying, nobody cares about us because we're international students and we can't vote. But you know, you understand what it's like. You were an international student. You were an immigrant. And, you know, you understand these issues. So thank you for running. I had so much uh, support and positive feedback that that's kind of what it became about then was not just about raising issues about climate change, but Mm -hmm. about standing up for the voice of the people, the voice of the marginalized, the voice of the poor and the normal people, not the 1%. And, um, that's what I'm doing. And I'm going to keep running. I'm going to keep holding politicians accountable because that's what we have to do. Because, you know, we are running out of time and it's, you know, like I said, you know, be the change you want to see in the world, right? I, I out totally agree. <laughs> be the change, be a voice for people and be the bridge between science and politics. I love it. That's amazing and inspiring. And it sounds like a lot of energy and work went into it, too, and continues to go into it. It's exhausting. Um, but yeah. what I've enjoyed most is uh, both the people I ran against are well-known cabinet ministers and have been elected for a long time. And um, they won't usually listen to me. But because I was running against them, I was able to debate them on a regular basis during the election for an hour, hour and a half, two hours, and basically call them out on all their policies and the lack of science and evidence and call them out on their lying and, and gaslighting people. 
And that is a platform that, like, you know, for me, it's not about, it wasn't like, it's okay if I didn't win, but it gave me this powerful platform to speak up for the people and be like, this is wrong. You know what is wrong, but you're doing it because you care about profit more than people on planet. And when else can we say that to politicians? Right, exactly. We need more bold people like you out there in the world. Thank you so much for doing that. So what do you do? I mean, science, pol- politics, you work in your community too. What do you do in your free time? To give you I a mean, it's not a lot of free time, but I, okay. I have a puppy who's turning one in two days. Yeah. He's turning a year old. He's a husky Australian shepherd mix. And he basically takes up whatever free time or not free time um i have but i also play ultimate frisbee i used to play on a club team Uh, i've been to worlds i've been to nationals but now i just play league uh getting too old to beat up my body in competitive frisbee (laughs) i love running i'm always running the trails in vancouver i'm hiking in the summer so you know growing up in the mountains just i need my access to forests and nature and vancouver is a city that gives it to me so yeah the puppy and sport and running takes up most of the time and you know, my puppy, by the way, you can put this in there or not. Like uh, he has his own yeah. Instagram. I was having followers. He's very cute. His Instagram handle is West Coast Panda Boy. Okay. I'm going to follow it on Instagram. Definitely. <laughs> I, so you have an um, amazing amount of energy and I love how much you are doing in this world. So thank you so much for joining us on Science Night. Where can people follow you? I know we know where to follow your puppy on Instagram. But where can we follow you? Well, Twitter would be the best um, because that's like the one I use all the time, be it for politics or science. Like right now it's science. If I'm running for political office, it becomes political. So that would be just at Kumari underscore Deviani, K-U-M-A-R-I underscore D-E-V-Y-A-N-I. I do have a Facebook and an Instagram, but I, that's pretty much political. So it only like, I really use it only during my political campaign. So Twitter is what I run and I would say the easiest way to connect with me. Uh, the other okay. two are purely political. <laughs> Got it. Anything else you want to talk about? I think Don't I want to tell people that, you know, I think a lot of people who are scientists would be listening is you don't have to necessarily run for politics to be able to make change. Uh, because I know a lot of us like in science were like, no, I don't want to be out there. People will look at me as biased, but there's a lot you can do. You can join local NGOs, provide your expertise. In that way, like when the elections are coming and this is for people in Canada, US, anywhere, uh, review political platforms and give your inputs on it, right? Because that's one way you can have the voice of science reflected in a platform. And trust me, like at least I know the Green Party and I can speak for them. We love having the input of scientists on our platform. I basically wrote their Green Recovery platform and we have five climate scientists uh, on our shadow cabinet right now federally who are working on our environment platforms and things. So give your feedback there and you can keep it anonymous where they don't say that X, Y, Z scientists gave yeah. it if you want to stay unbiased. Uh, you can also, you know, write policy briefs. You can, you know, there's a lot of these things you can do. And I really encourage us all to do it and get out of our comfort zone because, and not just for climate, you know, it can be for medicine. It can be for whatever field you're in. Try to reach out to these communities and organizations and, you know, make a difference because we are the ones with the knowledge and, you know, so let's try to get it out there and make it simple for politicians to take action. I love it. Thank you so much. I'm definitely going to be looking at some NGOs giving some input. I love it. Thank you so much for these great ideas too. And thank you so much for joining us on Science Night, Dr. Deviani Singh. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. It was lovely. Thank you so much to Dr. Deviani Singh for talking to us. That was such a great conversation. Steph, you did an amazing job with our guest. That is going to do it for this episode of the Science Night Podcast. If you want to follow me, my name is James Reed, and you can go to my Twitter at James underscore Reed 3. Steffi, where can they follow you? You can also follow me on Twitter at Steffi Deem. Jason, where can everybody find you? Uh, You can find me on Twitter, unless I'm curled up in a fetal position like I have been for the last couple weeks, but Twitter at OregonJM. Yeah. You can, yeah. You can still tweet from a corner. Yeah, you know. Huddled up. It, it, at least the Sixers are doing well. That's the only thing I can say about my Twitter Twitter page right now. So you can you can enjoy my tweets about the Sixers rise. 
Uh, otherwise, yeah. If you want to follow the Science Night podcast, go to our Twitter at Science Night and the number one, or go to our website, SciNight.com, where you can find our back catalog. You can find out our other social media handles. You can even buy merchandise to support this podcast. Everything and more you would ever want to find is at SciNight.com. We will be back in two weeks with another episode. And until then, have a great night. The Science Night Podcast is a proud member of the River Power Podcast Mill. To find out more about our shows, go to riverpower.xyz. Dates for listening.